It's Friday, December 17th, and you're locked into Real Talk, whether you're doing this live or later. We welcome you to the show. It's presented by our good friends at Bitcoin Well. Have you ever thought about giving Bitcoin for the holidays? Huh? Based on different cultural traditions, I know you're putting things in envelopes, putting things under a tree, putting things in stockings, presenting things in different ways, shapes, and forms. Why not consider Bitcoin? You're like, yeah, but Bitcoin's like 60 grand. Well, for like a whole one, for like a whole one. But imagine you just give somebody like $100 worth of Bitcoin. What a cool gift. How neat is that? It's kind of like an inroad into crypto, into understanding it all. If you'd like to do that, they've got gift cards in the whole nine yards. They can set you up with the Bitcoin wallet at Bitcoin Well. Find them under the Sponsors tab on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We have a fantastic show in store. Looking forward to introducing you to a guy. I think this guy's going to go somewhere. The more I look at the things he's done, the more I think he's really going to be a somebody someday. Uh, Colonel Chris Hadfield is going to be joining us in about 10 minutes. I don't know what you do with your life after you've been the commander of the International Space Station. You've kind of haven't you been to the mountaintop? Chris Hadfield's probably had a million people ask him this question before, but we're excited to get into his brand new book, The Apollo Murders. It's a Cold War thriller from the dark heart of the space race published earlier this fall. Can't wait to talk to the retired astronaut, engineer, former fighter pilot, absolute all-around beauty. Chris Hadfield is going to be joining us. And then our roundtable today, our Friday Real Talk roundtable, we're talking about photo radar. We're going to let you know ahead of time that we have three advocates for photo radar that are coming on the show. And so if you are like me, if you have some reservations around photo radar, and I told you earlier, the real talk on this is my position on photo radar is that my position has more holes in it than Swiss cheese. I just don't like getting the tickets. That's pretty much it. All right. So people are going to say like yesterday with the Alberta should separate argument where you go, this, this argument is just absolutely porous and easily quashed. I recognize my position on photo radar. Maybe similarly so, Uh, but still, there will be a little bit of pushback. What I'm really excited about, to be serious for 10 seconds, is uh, utilizing the results of our most recent Real Talk, the Get Real Question of the Week, presented by our research and strategy partners at Y Station. So we've got hundreds of you that chimed in on that, letting us know how you feel about photo radar. We'll put that in front of our panelists. Should be a great conversation. Sarah, before we go any further, you and I both got busted uh, for presenting an Alberta-based talk show yesterday and we didn't even realize it but one of our real talkers i don't know if he's on the west coast or not but he bailed us out you remember we were talking about barge chilling park yesterday uh-huh. and you and i were laughing about how you know vancouver's 
you know, the city of Vancouver put this sign out where that barge is still beached. It's still stuck based on that flooding and the mudslide and the whole nine yards. That yes. big, huge barge that's there. So they put up a sign, Barge Chilling Park, right? Barge Chilling Beach. Yeah. We thought that was pretty cool. And then Sean writes into the show. Did you see this? No. Sean writes in and he, guys, he goes, you guys know that Vancouver has Dude Chilling Park, right? Well, that's what it's based off of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Very relevant. I was like, that's old news. Big we, deal. <laughs> yeah, but we did not mention that yet. <laughs> that was not part of our conversation yesterday. I did not know that the city of Vancouver has Dude Chilling Park. Bar- oh. Barge Chilling Beach is obviously a reference to Dude Chilling Park. Yes. Yeah. Which just recently had its art refurbished. This is in the neighborhood of Mount Pleasant. And Sean put that on our radar yesterday. I loved it. Sorry, Sean. I, I should have. That was in my background. But I was like, no, what's the newsy thing? The yeah. newsy thing is. Well, and, and I've just lost all my West Coast credibility. I'm sorry for It's that. okay. It's been a long time since I was out there. You know what I realized? You hit this you hit this point in your life where I go, I used to say to people, I went to school on the West Coast, I went to university on the West Coast, and they'd be like, Oh no, wait, right on. And then people would go like, When was that? And now I'm like ninety six. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, twenty five years ago. What? I know I don't look it, but it was a Not, long time ago. You don't look at it like it was that at back all. when actually when average ordinary folks were able to buy houses in BC. In Vancouver. And there was no such thing kind as of. the Facebook. Thank God. Yes. No such thing as Facebook. <laughs> um, speaking of, Facebook went public, what was it, like four years ago or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Ish, maybe five. I don't remember. It's not some, I, I, I don't know. That was when I was like, should we get in on this IPO? I don't really know. What, mm. You know, there's like going to be a bunch of buzz around it. A lot of people, and do not ever take financial advice from me, ever, is Hadfield ready to go? I don't want to say, okay, let's, I won't spend too much time on this because like, we got the freaking guy here with us today. But yeah. um, depending on who you believe, people will say, unless you kind of have an inroad, don't buy on the IPO because a lot of times there's so much hype at the IPO that it's going to yeah. be higher than it will be. But Reddit is going public. Yeah, Reddit. For folks that don't know, it's, a, it's an online platform, kind of like news, kind of like Twitter, but not. It's kind of more... Forums. Yeah, forums. There yeah. we go. And that's where they actually pumped up meme stock like GameStop and MAC, uh, AMC rather. And uh, they're going to go they're going to go public. The plan is in early 2022, uh, they will go onto the stock exchange currently. Do you want to guess what Reddit is valued at? Uh, well, I can say it would be in the billions for sure, but uh-huh. I don't know. Like, I I, I want to ask: Are you a redditor, Sam? You strike me as a redditor. I, th- that's not an insult. That's a compliment. <laughs> that's not an insult at all. No, I I I've, I've said this before on the show too. It's like I don't. <laughs> I just don't know. If it's... I don't scroll Reddit. I don't choose Reddit. But if I need like nerdy advice over something very specific, yeah. like Reddit forums are always the first place. to Yes, go. there's yeah. a lot of really smart people on Reddit. So would you be inclined to invest in Reddit? Like, do you see it has a bright future? Is there a revenue model that you? Can- I. I think that, you know, Reddit is is kind of this sort of like last bastion of like old school public message boards. Yeah. And that's totally. kind of what the inherent value comes from. So, I mean, again, don't take advice from me too, but like this one interests me. This one interests me because Reddit over its whole arc has had a really good sense of, of what it is and what it isn't. It isn't okay. Facebook. It isn't Twitter. It right. isn't, you know, just this like sort of like very commercialized, shiny sharing platform like those ones are. It's it's like, it's a little bit more stripped down. It's a little bit more of a community. So Which yeah. makes me wonder if that might hurt its revenue potential mm, but then again, yeah. what the hell do i know about you know g- generating billions of dollars in revenue but they themselves Nothing. generated like super hype and and boosted gamestop like mm-hmm. they are the ones that did that so you didn't answer my question how much do you think it's worth oh uh well i said billions um do i get a point for that it's got to be in the billions i'm gonna say uh uh i don't know geez i'm guessing like eight billion i don't know you're really close what is Ten. It? That's what they say it's worth about $10 billion yeah, right, now? Value that right now? Okay. Interesting. I'd be curious to know from Real Talkers if that's something that, that you'd be interested in. Hit us up on Twitter. Uh, you can use our hashtag if you want to make sure it catches our attention. Real Talk RJ. That hashtag is powered by the team at Park Power, your friendly local utilities provider. Right now, electricity, natural gas, and internet. They can hook you up with all three, and you can check their rates, compare their rates right now. Uh, Chris, the CEO over at Park Power, was was quick to point out to me a while ago. He said, obviously, with electricity prices somewhat volatile as of late, people are going to notice that their bills are a little bit more expensive. He says this is a great time to take a look at our variable rate versus the regulated rate option. Okay, he says, you you might want to look to this fixed rate offering. And Park Power currently, at the first of every month, offers these flexible fixed rates for electricity on one and three-year terms. 
The best part about it, I think, as a consumer, is that you're never locked in. So you can switch rates or you can cancel any time. So there's no catch. There's no hook. There's no sort of fine print where they're going to screw you. Park Power with the promo code 2021-REALTALK will give you $70 off your first bill. I should point out again, we're not going to screw you is not their official company slogan, rather one that we've come up with here on Real Talk. Also, big shout out to our friends at Athabasca University. This is the time of year. You know it. I mean, whether or not you officially make a New Year's resolution, we kind of turn the page, don't we? When we turn the calendar from December to January, it's a time of renewal, a time of new opportunities. If you've been thinking about going back to school, Athabasca University is a great option for you. You can study anytime, anywhere. Take as little or as much time as you like to complete the course or the program. They are as flexible as you need them to be. You can check them out online at AthabascaU.com. Our leadoff guest this morning is an absolute legend, uh, not just in Canada, not just on planet Earth, in fact, a former commander of the International Space Station. He's a retired Canadian Space Agency astronaut, engineer, a former fighter pilot, the first Canadian to perform extravehicular activity in space. I'm pretty sure he's the first Canadian to play Major Tom to ground control. Wasn't that, wasn't that him? I think, that, I think he was probably the first. I don't think anybody did it before Chris Hadfield did. He's flown two space shuttle missions, and uh, he's also an author of some wildly popular books, including The Darkest Dark, which our six-year-old Wyatt has up on his bookshelf, prominently displayed, uh, getting into how... Young Chris Hadfield first fell in love and fascination with the universe. What a thrill to welcome Chris Hadfield to Real Talk. Thanks for making time for us. This is the third time we've had a chance to speak, but it's been years, and I've got to say I've missed catching up with you. You're always up to something. Good morning, Ryan, and good morning to Wyatt also. I'm glad he's enjoying the book. Oh, man, his I wish I could show you his room right now. He's got his mom's done an amazing job with decals. And he's got, of course, like, you know, the entire solar system up there and the glow in the dark stuff. And he's got the lights that project the phases of the moon reflect on his wall. And it's your book. He loves going to your book. He's used it to learn to read. He's used it to learn about space. I'm sure you've heard that from a thousand different parents or little kids themselves. What does that mean to you? Well, that's where the reality of your life begins, right? In your childhood dreams. That's where you start deciding what you might do with your life. What, you know, what books you're going to read, what movies you're going to watch, what, what, what gets your heart going faster. And so I think it's really important. It's why I wrote The Darkest Dark. And it's not just, you know, to entertain children, but it's how to deal with fear in your life, how it's okay to be afraid, but to understand that, you know, the dark is where your dreams occur. And so it, we were, it's harder to write a kid's book than you might think, Ryan, and, and uh, worked really hard on that book. Uh, and the, uh, the artists that did that book, the Fan Brothers, they're, they're now uh, some of the leading book uh, illustrators in the world. They've just won several awards. So it was really nice to be able to work with them fairly early in their career. Okay, so I'm, I'm curious to pick your brain, and, and I'll note that we're here to talk about your new book, and we will. Don't worry, The Apollo Murders, a very cool, a Cold War thriller, fiction, of course, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to getting into it from the dark heart of the space race. Uh, but, but let me ask you, when, when, when someone that served as commander of the International Space Station, when someone that's flown fighter jets says that writing a kid's book is really difficult, uh, we recognize that there are different skill sets that it takes, et cetera. What's so difficult? What was most difficult about writing for kids? Now, everybody thinks they can write a children's book because they seem sort of, you know, Dr. Zeusy, right? It's just, hey, you make some silly rhymes and draw some silly pictures and how hard can that be? Um, part of it is that the, the, the market is absolutely flooded with children books. So what, what can you write that is different than isn't already out there? Also, it takes a much bigger team because you have the full illustration side and, and you've really got to think about a, a different market. Most of us, just like you with uh, sort of being current on the West Coast, but no longer actually current on the West Coast, none of us adults are current as children anymore. And we think we are. Um, and so uh, trying to get the tone right, trying to make sure that it's something that will become a forever book for a child, trying to get the illustrations that match the text, and then putting together that whole team so that uh, it really becomes something that'll sit on Wyatt's shelf and he'll want to read it again and again. You know, that, that, that's harder than it sounded, um, but I'm, I'm super proud of that book. It was a New York Times bestseller and, yeah. and, uh, and it's had a lot of great reaction. It's in a bunch of languages. You know, that, that's really delightful to see. That's and, and I would I mean, it's a great time of year for people to check that out. It's a perfect gift through the holiday season. That's that's got to be something kind of uh, did that take some getting used to as, as someone that's I mean, yeah, you're an astronaut. You're pretty high profile. You were you were an astronaut and certainly a commander. 
uh, of the ISS in the age of social media. So you were able to do some really cool things. So you're, you're one of those few Canadians that would have well over a million followers on social media. Not not many. There's a lot of Canadian celebrities that would have 100,000, but you are more of a global celebrity. Did that take some getting used to, especially once you sort of returned to Earth and your agents started taking speaking requests and all those types of things? Well, as an astronaut with the Canadian Space Agency, uh, I spoke in schools and businesses and rotary clubs and and you know, the United Nations and everything for over 20 years. And uh, so uh, lots of experience of being a public figure. And, you know, after my first space flight back in 95, I was on the cover of Time magazine. But all that's sort of derivative of what's actually happening. You know, I was I was passionately and, and focusedly uh, trying to do something that no Canadian had ever done and do it as well as I personally possibly could. And that was true of my time in the military and my time at the Canadian Space Agency. And the fact that everyone else thinks it's kind of interesting and, and is maybe inspired by it, you know, that's that's really nice. And how it affects me personally, Ryan, it's like, um, I don't know, when you go to a big, maybe Christmas time here, uh, where you go into a family gathering and there's a bunch of people, you know, depending what COVID's going to let us do, mm. there's like second cousins that you don't really even know their name, you know. And I sort of feel like that everywhere I go. Everybody's just my second cousin, and they go, "Hey, Chris, how are you?" And I'm going, "Hey, how are you?" I don't really know who you yeah. are, but yeah, nice to meet you. And, Everybody knows you, um, but you're not sure. Yeah. And, and the nice thing is, is that you'll get a pass if you ever forget anybody's name. You're, you know, people are like, well, you meet a thousand people a day, so you don't have to worry about it. You know, that's sort of a thing. We were, we were curious. We were, we were just small talking before we went on live this morning and and talking about some of the tensions right now, you know, as, as Russia is sending troops to the border with Ukraine and, and President Biden saying you guys better kind of back off here. And you see these tensions, these these tensions between nations, between global superpowers. And we were wondering when you're up on the International Space Station with cosmonauts or astronauts from other countries, what have you, are there politics there? Is 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 there sort of an uh, you know a, a brotherhood of sorts, a fraternity? What, how would you describe the dynamic up there between national representatives, essentially? Yeah, I mean, what happens on Earth is obviously the only truly thing that matters to to the vast population of everybody, and that's how it ought to be. But when you're on board the spaceship and, and you look at, you know, it's sort of like looking at an anthill and seeing all the little ants scurrying around. And they, they sure seem purposeful, but but it just, you know, when you look at it from a different perspective, you think, hey, the, look at the big picture, ants. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of history here. We've been around for 300,000 years as a species, and we think today is the most important thing that ever happened. But you know, a little bit of, of more global understanding seeps into you from a spaceship. Um, and for the crew on board, I mean, we are, our life is constantly threatened. We have each other's lives in our hands all the time. And uh, and you're doing really complicated scientific technical stuff, research. And there's a terrific unifying nature to attempting something really hard. And it doesn't matter where you were born or, or you know, what religion your parents raised you with or what your mother tongue was. What really matters is um, how well can we try and get this thing done together as a small group of humans today? And the world is going to be a political mess for another 10,000 years, just like it has been for the last 10,000 yeah. years. Um, but so, so yeah, you, you're, you're in a very lucky position to have separated yourself from it and the unifying danger and objectives of where you are. They, they overrule everything else. Do you ever consider following in Mark Garneau's footsteps? Do you ever see a career in politics? No, I, I served the, as a public servant for 35 years. So, no, I, I, I'm very much enjoying being a private citizen. Yeah, I, I don't blame you one bit. Hey, let's talk about this book, uh, The Apollo Murders, uh, a Cold War thriller uh, in the dark heart of the space race. It's, it's been out since uh, mid-October. People are really excited about it. How did this come about? Yeah, it was number one on Amazon in Canada yesterday. It's doing superbly well, which is great. Um, uh you know, it's my fourth book, but when you write a factual book, uh, you're kind of constrained. You know, you got to tell stories or, or sort of draw conclusions or something that are going to make uh, sense to people. But when you write fiction, now suddenly you have a whole different uh, palette of colors to draw from. And you can really start to maybe dig into stuff that wouldn't have come up in a factual book. How would, for example, when, when something bad happens, how do different people react? 
And what is their gut reaction? What's going on inside their head? And when you write fiction, suddenly you can tell the story of what it's like to fly in space in a much more colorful and uh, and revealing way. And and the, the, I set the, it's alternative history fiction, thriller fiction. And it's already in, uh, I think, 14 languages and a bestseller in multiple countries. But I think um, uh, the story of, of what was going on in the early 70s, as you said, space race and uh, the Cold War. And I used to be a Cold War fighter pilot uh, up there in Cold Lake and then on the East Coast. Um, and, and all of that interplay and the secret Soviet space station that was up at the time for real, uh, about, I don't know, 90 percent of the Apollo murders is real, th- real people, real things that happen. And I just got this twisted plot that fits in amongst it all um, and eventually comes back to Earth. And I learned a huge amount writing it. And, and I'm delighted that so many people are reading it now. Yeah, no kidding. It's and it's uh, I mean, we, we were referencing earlier, obviously, when when uh, when you sang David Bowie's Space Oddity um, and that was just like an iconic moment. You know, you're sitting here singing ground control to Major Tom and playing guitar in space. It's just like people go, this is one of the coolest things we've ever seen. But what I loved about it, and I, I know it's not lost on you, is is that it was it was a scientist. And, and to you there, I mean, there's so much that someone that's an astronaut, there's so much science and data and physics and, and capabilities when it comes to the pilot of these crafts and everything that goes into it but here you are artistically expressing yourself and that's what i think is so cool i mean any anybody of of substance like yourself any someone with a name you know that knows that they could sell you know a, an autobiography can you know you put out an astronaut's guide to life on earth which was obviously saw huge success but people can work i'm not saying you did people can work with a ghostwriter do whatever but not everybody can write a kid's book. Not everybody can write fiction that rises right to the top of the charts. Have you, have you always had this, this artistic calling as well? Has that always been part of who Chris Hadfield is? You know, when, when I was outside on my first spacewalk, we went through the aurora. Like I got to physically be outside by myself with the, well, like the Northern light, it was the Southern lights, but the same thing, pouring around the ship and rippling between my legs. And it's extremely scientific, Ryan. You know, it's exquisitely scientific. How does the Aurora form and, and why does the earth have that? But the art of the science, the art that's behind it is just exquisitely beautiful. And, and I find uh, artistic inspiration and beauty in every single thing I've ever done in my life. And I've always liked writing. I mean, it was my favorite subject in school, but I, I knew that if I studied writing, they weren't going to let me, you know, command a spaceship. So, so I studied engineering. Um, but I, I've always enjoyed uh, trying to express myself, whether it's, you know, music with my guitar over my shoulder here or, or the other things that I've done. Um, if you have a unique experience in your life, then how are you going to share it, right? How do you just tell somebody about it? Do you make up a story? Do you write a song about it? Do you drop, make a painting of it? Do you write, write a book about it? And I've been so lucky with the experiences in my life. And I've just been trying to find different ways to share them as effectively as I can. And it's great when, uh, when other people have a chance to, to talk with me or read about it, or, or, you know, I did a master class or all, or I've done some TV series. All of those are, are just ways to share the incredible privilege of the experiences that I've had. I, I can't even imagine how your brain works right now. I'm imagining you tethered to a spacecraft with the Southern lights rippling through your legs. And I've got chills running up and down my spine. I mean, in that moment, what are you thinking to yourself? Are you exclaiming things out loud? I mean, how are you even wrapping your mind or are, are you totally hundred percent focused on what you're doing? Well, they had the lights on inside the ship. They were driving me around on the end of Canada arm, our big robot arm. And I, and, but oh, I yeah, had my light do. shut yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. I had my light shut off. And so I could see it. I said, guys, guys, you got to see this. We're in the Aurora. And so the, the arm like lurched to a stop and they shut off all the lights inside. So they get their night vision and then they're all taking pictures and the oohs and ahs. And then you come driving out of it and into, into the sunrise over New Zealand at the time. But that moment it's, you just realize you're caught in something so much more huge and beautiful than yourself. And you, you try and turn on every receptor you've got to try and just soak this moment up. So you don't miss your own life. Yeah. And, and then you're going to have to, figure out how, how do I internalize this back into who I am? And then how do I 
take that, turn it around and do my very best to share it with other people. You know, it's just what a, what a incredibly rare moment in time. And I got to be the lucky little Canadian kid who was out there on the end of the arm. I had a chance, uh, well, I've had a chance over the years to talk to my uncle, quite candidly, Jungle Jim Hunter. He was one of the original Crazy Canucks. He won uh, a bronze medal in 72 in Sapporo. And uh, talk to him about what it's like to retire from competitive ski racing when you're when you're going 140 kilometers an hour in Kitzbühel, Austria, you know, to go to regular life. Or when you're on the edge, on the end of the Canadarm and 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 the Aurora is around you. And then you, you come back and you're standing in line, you know, at Friesen Brothers to, to, to ring in your Christmas orange is like is there is there kind of a i don't i don't want to use the word depression lightly but is there something that happens almost kind of a letdown when you return back to earth and you realize virtually nobody can relate to some of the highest peaks of your life i don't know what it was like for jungle jim hunter it's a little different uh you know, but there's probably some comparisons. But if you've ever been to a magnificent, you go out to Jasper, right, uh, in the dark sky, or walk into the Sistine Chapel, or you eat something that is so exquisitely delicious, does that spoil the rest of your life? I, I think, in fact, it illustrates the rest of your life. You know that those things are out there, that there is this incredible richness beyond standing in line to buy Christmas oranges. And so while I'm in line buying my Christmas oranges, it's that other stuff. That, that is that is seeding my thoughts and my imagination. If anything, it just deepens and broadens uh, my appreciation for what's going on. So no, I, and, and it, it also taught me so many things. You know, it allowed me to have the background to, to write this book. You know, it gave me all of that insight. So no, I, uh, I, 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 you know, everybody's wired differently and deals with their own life differently. But the, the magical experiences in my life, those are the ones that that uh, that I treasure the most and make me smile when there's nothing else entertaining going on. It makes us feel OK about taking up your time. Then you can still re- <laughs> you can still relate to us plebs. Uh, I know a lot of people are going to be ordering the Apollo murders. So they're going to go find it at their local bookstore today to make sure that they have it in, in time for this break where they can maybe finally get some reading done. <clears throat> Do you find you, you t- so many people have asked you so much about the International Space Station and space travel and all this kind of stuff? I mean, your career is a fighter pilot the background for this story here i mean your cold war fighter pilot stationed out of you know cold lake alberta uh, that to a lot of people is a that's a remarkable i mean if that's your mountain top that's a remarkable career right there that's a remarkable experience um i mean had, had you had you never been involved with the canadian space agency could you have seen a long a prolonged career there with the military in that context what what an amazing involvement yeah, I was lucky enough to, well, both partially deliberately, but partially just by circumstance, love every succeeding step of my life. Mm. You can choose to hate your life or love it. I've always chosen to love my life. Um, but to be a fighter, I did the very first CF-18 intercept of the Soviets during the Cold War, just off the coast of Newfoundland in the dark of night with an armed Soviet bomber, you know, practicing cruise missile launches on North America. Oh, that flight, they were just on their way down to Cuba. But still, an armed Soviet bomber coming into the edge of Canadian airspace, you know, and I'm out there in the dark of night intercepting them. You know, I was I was on that pointy end. And I, I really uh, think every Canadian should serve their country for some portion of their life. I think it gives you a better appreciation of the the uh, luck that we have to be citizens of this place but also it, it was just uh, such a great technical challenge to be able to do that and and funnily enough um, the the sequel to the Apollo murders will dig into that side of things a little bit more so so I'm, I'm actually way deep in my mind right now as I'm writing the next book in the series um, in in that part of, of society and that part of thinking and I'm uh, looking for that book won't be out for another year and a half or so but but you know it, it's what uh, what keeps me interested and engaged and I'm really enjoying the constant learning and discovery that comes from challenging myself to do something new. That that strikes me as something that's probably been constant through your life since you were a, a, a little farm kid growing up. Um, we appreciate your time, Chris. Uh, let me let me just ask you in closing. How, how can I not ask you about this? You know, this new trend of of space travel. Uh, maybe you'll want to even dig in on whether it qualifies as space travel. But you know who I'm talking about? All the billionaires, Branson and Bezos, and all these guys. Um, after he went up into space, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos said he saw the world differently. William Shatner, the actor, said 
something similar. These guys are, you know, up out, you know, in orbit, I guess you might call it like blue origin for about 10 minutes and 20 seconds or so. Uh, what do you, does that qualify as space travel in your books? What do you make of the trend of billionaires heading up there? Is it a good thing for space exploration? How are you wrapping your mind around what you're seeing? Well, I, th- I think you're falling victim to uh, focusing on the dangling, shiny object of, of uh, polarizing billionaires. I focus on Wally Funk, who flew in space. Uh, she would have been probably a NASA astronaut if we'd had different societal rules in the 60s. 82 years old, a life, life, a life of aviation, and she got to fly in space. Or uh, Sarisha Bandla, who flew with Virgin Galactic. She was born in India and came to North America to make her fortune. And now she had a chance to fly in space. And and so, you know, if if you had started that company and invested in it for 20 years and built it to this level of technological capability, I mean, you have some onus to put your money where your mouth is and ride it for the first time to show that you think it's safe. Imagine if the CEO of Pfizer or, or whatever, one of the vaccine companies, imagine if they said, okay, we put all this money, I'm not actually going to take it myself, but you can all take it. So I I think, you know, those are not normal men who run those big companies are odd people, but they're doing an odd thing. I think what's important to focus on are some of the other human stories, but also it is a clear indicator that the technology has gotten so much simpler and, and safer and therefore cheaper that it's opening up space commerce like we've never seen it. And then the definition of whether they're astronauts. I mean, if you fly above 50 miles above the earth, then uh, you've been to what we sort of, it doesn't magically turn into space. The atmosphere just tails off. But by legal definition, yeah, you've been in space. So you can call yourself an astronaut. You're not a professional astronaut. If you go flying in Air Canada, I mean, you're not the pilot, you know, but <laughs> But you did go flying, and a lot of people have never gone flying. So I don't belittle the experience, but uh, I don't know. There seems to be some confusion as to uh, as to whether you're flying it or not. And you know, that's that's we're just in transition right now, and we need better regulation. Just like when we when cars were new or when airplanes were new, we'll sort it out. But to me, the real important thing is the human stories and the fact that access to space is so much cheaper and we've got to decide collectively as a species what does this mean for us yeah nailed it obviously uh for the record i think it's awesome i think it's awesome that people are going up there i think it's awesome and and like you said they're they're odd people but when we're talking about these innovators and these people that have built these enormous like in anything i mean galileo for his time was was outrageous you know i mean yes. you know a lot, a lot of these guys were essentially nailed up to crosses uh for their perspectives and so i yeah. just i'm not necessarily drawing a direct line but I think it's great. I love the brazen nature of it. I love the unapologetic exploration of it. Um, you know, and, and like you said, there's a ton to be considered, but I find it fascinating. So do I. And um, and it's, it's difficult and dangerous to try and do things that are new. And I've committed most of my life to that. But I also find it fascinating and extremely rewarding. And And you've got to put it in perspective of everything else. You know, how well does Canada take care of its citizens versus what we we spend on space exploration. But if, if you feel that in the back of your mind, if you just dig into the actual numbers of the amount relatively that we spend, how much work it is, what it brings for inspiration to our kids like Wyatt, you know, the, the balance becomes pretty self-evident. It's one of those easy issues to get outraged with no facts over until you dig into it. And you go, yeah, this should be some small part of, of what Canada is capable of offering to its citizens. And I, I strongly believe that. And that's why I work with all the space companies and and even write novels about it. Colonel Chris Hadfield, a retired astronaut and author of the best-selling book, The Apollo Murders, a Cold War thriller from the dark heart of the space race. You can find it anywhere you buy good books. Uh, Of course, a ton of people have checked it out already. Make sure you do the same. His other children's book, which I highly recommend, The Darkest Dark, and his memoir, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, What Going to Space Taught Me About Ingenuity, Determination, and Being Prepared for anything it's always such a pleasure to speak with you one of the classiest people representing proudly our country chris thanks for doing this thanks ryan have a good holiday yeah you as well that's chris hadfield what a legend right and it's like every everything he answers is just like you can tell he's got i think he thinks bigger than just the questions right i love how he tips his cap to other people that have explored space in different capacities and contexts it's not just neil armstrong buzz aldrin you know etc cetera, etc cetera, right very cool stuff. I, I just love the fact that he acknowledges that, you know, there were limitations around who who had access. Yeah. Um, 
was that that great film Hidden Figures about the women, uh, the mathematicians, right? Yeah, the black yeah. women who were involved in getting the spaceships up, yeah. and back. Yeah, no um, kidding. That was a great film. Yeah, so I just I loved the the acknowledgement of that. Yeah. Um, by Chris Hadfield. It's great. Make sure you check out his book. Uh, and we love when you uh, smash like on our content. We love when you share it. It means a lot to us when you subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to our podcast, and tell all your friends about it. Coming up in just a moment, we're going to get into our Real Talk Roundtable on Photo Radar. And I want to broaden the conversation to talk about urban design and these, you know, these uh, Vision Zero type campaigns. They want to have um, zero, uh, you know, accidents, zero pedestrians hit, zero fatalities, which, which obviously everybody wants. But at the same time, people go, well, that's not realistic. I find, and I won't get too off track here, I promise. But we get into these types of convers- conversations. People go, we want to have zero accidents. And someone goes, well, that's never going to happen. And both people are correct. We do want to have it. It's never going to happen. But let's try to make it happen. It's like saying we're going to eradicate homelessness in a city. And someone will say that's never going to happen. People have been homeless throughout the millennia. There's always been people that haven't been a fit in the traditional housing by choice or by otherwise. That doesn't mean you don't try to set up infrastructure, programs, supports, etc. Right. So I always appreciate when people set the bar high. And then it's up to sort of everybody else to try to do their part to see if they can make that happen. So we're going to get into these campaigns. We've got three great voices joining us on the show. And then, of course, trash talk still coming. Don't worry, Tracy. We got your email. We got an email. The, the inbox dinged, and it was like late submission to Trash Talk. She went off, and I was like, you are in, girl. So that's coming up in Trash Talk. First, let me remind you, even though in our neck of the woods, we don't know where you're tuning in from, it is literally minus 30 today. Uh, absolutely brutal but that's not are you loving it you love minus 30 i love it i love how cold like it's a dry cold it's a dry i just i love getting (laughs) really i love just getting really cozy putting the toque on agreed like bundling up we're gonna have eggnog going in the studio later yeah Uh, we'll have our like lo-fi what's it called the music we've been listening to has been called the lo-fi holiday lo-fi winter chill lo-fi winter chill it's like the three of us in here just we're just missing the big puffy coats maybe we could go to breathe outdoors for that as a matter of fact sam hard swerve i'll get to eden landscaping in just a second i love them but if we're talking about puffy coats if we're talking about outfitting ourselves for the great outdoors why not get on to breathe outdoors.ca like right now you can save up to 40 percent off outdoor gear it is of course their winter adventure sale that we've been telling you about this week it's all the top brands that you trust and you don't have to necessarily be a camper you know you remember campers village well this is them now reinvented breathe outdoors this might be for your dog walk this might be for some sort of a winter adventure you're about to go on over the holidays. Maybe you're going to head out and do the Moline Canyon Ice Walk in Jasper. Make sure that you're properly geared up from the team that's been trusted for decades at breatheoutdoors.ca. Our friends at Eden Landscaping know that, and here we go. Even though it's minus 30 outside, the ground is frozen. It's a perfect time to get the ball rolling on your spring or summer landscaping project. Mike was reminding me that supply chain issues are real and your project may require materials that could take months to get here. Don't wait until April to check them out at landscapeedmonton.ca. They take you from design all the way through to completion. You're not hiring anybody other than them and they don't leave the job site until you are completely satisfied. That's Eden Landscaping, again, under the Sponsors tab on our website. Hey, I know a lot of people are going to be all over the road this weekend right now, whether it's because you still got your summer tires on or maybe you're driving two-wheel drive. Why not check out the brand new inventory? They've got the 2022 Jeep Wagoneers in, along with those Grand Cherokee L's. That's the seven-seater, third-row seating Grand Cherokee, the most awarded SUV of all time. Better selection than anywhere else in Alberta at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge because they share inventories. So if there's a truck... Uh, Just 20 minutes away at the other dealership, they'll make sure they get it to you so you can take it for a test drive. You can check out their inventory online. Again, you'll find them on our website. And finally, our friends at Grand Dog Essentials are delivering quality raw food to proud puppy owners across the province. It's door-to-door delivery in Edmonton, Calgary, and parts of central Alberta on a weekly basis with a minimum order of 50 bucks. Don't forget, whether it's raw food, whether it's supplements, maybe joint health for your dog, your coat could look better. Those supplements also included. You can get 10% off your first time order with the promo code REALTALK at granddog.ca. 
All right, so everybody hates getting photo radar tickets. Let's be honest. Nobody loves it. Uh, now, whether or not that influences how you feel about photo radar may be a different sort of a conversation. But we all get, you know, you get that envelope in the mail and you go, ah, and sometimes you go, yeah, I've been expecting you. I saw the flash as I drove under that freeway overpass. I knew it was coming. Other times you're going, what? Wait, what? I obey the law. We polled you. We asked you by way of our question of the week about photo radar. And now we've built a real talk roundtable about it. Looking forward to getting into it in just a second. Sam, let's take a quick look, a quick review at some of the highlights of the results so we can pave the way for this conversation one in ten of you 11 percent of real talkers have never received a ticket well must be nice congratulations to the one in ten of you who have never received a photo radar ticket seriously congratulations that means 89 percent of us have here's another highlight from that conversation two out of three of you 65 percent of those of you polled so that even if you're not speeding you instinctively slow down if you see a big bright photo radar truck now is that causing risk of accident i don't know we'll get into it but you immediately hammer your brakes two out of three of you including me when you see that bright yellow truck here's another interesting poll from our data three out of four of you 73 percent of real talkers polled believe that photo radar is a setup to trick people at least to some extent and finally here's another highlight 86 percent of you have a simple solution and this is what drives me nuts mostly because it's true 86 percent of you have a simple solution to not getting a photo radar ticket don't speed yeah yeah brent totter is president of totter and urban works out of vancouver more than 20 years experience in advanced and innovative urbanism he's vancouver's former chief planner he advises cities and innovative developments all around the world ottawa oslo sydney medellin auckland helsinki the guy's been all over the world steering very cool projects jessica lamar is the city of edmonton's director of safe mobility she leads the city's road safety engineering automated enforcement and community activation teams in support of that vision zero campaign and we're going to get into that and stephen race is a registered professional planner uh, currently a first year law student at the university of alberta he's been part of active transportation in, in, in an advisory and advocacy role uh, it's called paths for people you've probably heard of it he served on that board for the last three years or so i want to warmly welcome all three of you to the show i want to invite you to treat this like we're all out for coffee so you can jump in on one another you can tell me i'm being a buffoon if i'm being a buffoon but why don't we get into some of this data right out of the gates brent it seems to me like most of our audience has received a photo radar ticket but at the same time most of them really lack sympathy for people who get them including themselves where do you stand on photo radar effective or ineffective as a safety tool well, I stand with the data and the data from studies shows that it works. It shows that a uh, most recent study that I that I tweeted out recently showed that within 500 meters of photo radar stations, the number of accidents drops significantly and the number of fatalities drops even more significantly. So I'm, I'm not interested in a, in a debate about whether it works. There's actual evidence that shows it works. So end of debate from my perspective. OK, so <laughs> Well, that, well, this is going to make for a lousy roundtable and probably most especially because I think all three of you are probably going to echo what Brent just said, which is the evidence points to the fact that this is effective. But Jessica, you've been a big part of this, haven't you? I mean, you know, this is right in your wheelhouse uh, with regards to the majority of the opposition against photo radar. Would you describe it as emotional? You know, um, here's what I would say is the beauty of automated enforcement is that it's an objective way to help keep our roads safe. And what that means is we target a behavior, not a human being. So there's a great equity component to this as well. The trouble with targeting a behavior objectively is that it's hard to argue with. And so we have to pivot into these other concerns. Was it in the right spot? Do they have the right intentions? You know, was the truck bright enough? Um, and we make these arguments to make ourselves feel better. Because I think it's accessing this like inner shame monster we have when we're confronted with accountability around, you know, whether or not um, we privileged our own convenience over the comfort and safety of other humans. Okay. Fair enough. Everybody's dropping bombs right now. Uh, the people that are adverse to photo radar are, are already considering the retreat here. And we haven't even heard from Stephen yet. Uh, Stephen, paths for people, for folks that are going to be, you know, tuning in or downloading this podcast from outside of the jurisdiction where you operate. What's it all about and how does it fit into this conversation? 
Mm -hmm. So Paths for People is a nonprofit that is based in Edmonton. We've been in an existence in about, uh, since about 2015, and we're focused on safer, more livable streets. And so a component of that is definitely photo radar. It's one tool that we can be using to have safer, more livable streets. Um, but, you know, our community across the city of about 1500 members um, understands that it is a really nuanced conversation, that it is really complicated, and that we do have to be doing many different kinds of things to get towards that goal of Vision Zero. So can you give me an example, and then I'll throw this back over to Brent, can you give me an example of some of the nuance? Like, can you see some protest against speed, photo speed endorsement where you go, yeah, I think that's actually a pretty decent point? Part of it is the way our roads are designed. Um, in some ways, it compels people to drive faster than they should be driving. Um, you know, the, the sense of the road being wide, the sense of the road having uh, limited stopping points or stop signs or yield signs. Um, our streets uh, have kind of uh, compel this all, they make us feel like we should be going a certain way. And it, it, you know, this kind of sense of like, we need to move really quickly. Um, you know, driving is the one way to get around. It definitely, uh, has like become embedded in our minds and how we see movement. And so, yeah, it's complicated because that takes a long time to erode. Mm, I could tell, uh, Brent, the minute that you heard Steven say the way our roads are designed, you just started nodding your head. I mean, you've obviously, uh, participated in urban design at the highest levels, literally in the world. I mean, take us into that theory or how that plays out. Well, if we're serious about actually saving lives, like we say we are, there's three key parts. One is actually, and this is something that's a bit strange for North American audiences, but the first thing is to actually have fewer cars. The two cities in the world that have actually gotten the closest, very close to vision zero, almost no deaths over the course of a year, uh, from traffic collisions are Helsinki and Oslo. And one of the key ways they actually did it is by reducing the overall number of cars. There's actually fewer cars driving and more people walking, biking and take public transit. So that's part of it. Then, then assuming you're working with the cars that you have, there's two things. There's one, is the actual speed limit itself. We talk about photo radar, but photo radar is an enforcement technique to make sure you're staying to the speed limit. It begs the question, is the speed limit the right speed limit in the first place? And many of our, and the big debate about actually saving lives is about reducing the speed limit. Because again, the data, the facts show that if you slow down the speed limit and enforce it so that people actually follow the speed limit through photo radar or whatever, it saves tremendous amount of lives in terms of collisions, because collisions and, and deaths and injuries by collisions have actually been going up in recent years because the vehicles are getting bigger and more deadly to people on bikes and people walking. So, so part of it is the speed limit itself, reduce the speed limit, then make sure you actually enforce it. And that's where photo radar fits into the picture. But the other part of it is what we call design speed. And a lot of people say, if you don't get the speed of the roads right, it do doesn't matter what the speed limit is. That's wrong. That's wrong because both of them actually work. Mm -hmm. You lower the speed limit, but then you actually change the design of the street to create more friction, to create more attention necessary so that drivers are actually paying attention. And you've, what you've done is reduce the design speed so people naturally want to go slower anyway. One of the problems is we design our streets terribly as car sewers that almost encourage people to go fast because it feels like there's no friction. There's nothing here to make me think I should slow down. So I go fast, even if the speed limit is, is, uh, is lower than that. So it's two parts. It's lowering your speeds and enforcing that. And actually, over time, because this does take longer, redesign your streets and make sure that your new streets are actually designed better to save lives. So, Jessica, I mean, in your role as the city of Edmonton's director of safe mobility, how does what Brent is saying apply to what you're doing, including decisions in the department on a, on a daily basis? Yeah, it totally fits. Uh, Brent's right. It's a full system that you have to put in place to support safe and livable streets. So, you know, my team is only, you know, a small component of a 10,000 person team at the city. But when we look at city planning, when we look at transportation related work, we have to think about all those elements. We need to make sure that right from the get go, we're planning uh, development that's supporting Vision Zero and that's taking that design into account. 
We have lots of really amazing programs at the city that are taking a look at our more mature neighborhoods and doing neighborhood renewal, which helps us again to put in place some of those uh, more progressive traffic calming measures that help create the environment for livability in our neighborhoods. We have automated enforcement. We work really closely with our colleagues in the Edmonton Police Service to complement that automated uh, enforcement with in-person enforcement. And then we have to like really keep working on the culture piece here. And that's where education, that's where getting the community involved. Um, and that's where, you know, awareness really comes into account. So when we help people understand what Brent is saying, that the data shows this is effective, we partner very closely with the University of Alberta, Dr. Kareem Elvacioni, who is the Urban Traffic Safety Research Chair, to look at automated enforcement and to look at our crash numbers and speed numbers in Edmonton and we can show very clearly the presence of automated enforcement makes our streets safer. And I, I think some of the challenge is really getting out to people to make sure we're not confusing and conflating the actual science of safety. Um, and I saw from you know some of your survey results that, that folks don't necessarily believe that slower is safer, that slower will save lives. So I think we have lots of work to do there. There was, uh, uh, and, and please, Jessica or Stephen, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong on this, because I can't remember exactly how it's played out. But but in our home city, we're talking about Edmonton, every Canadian city will be different, obviously. There was just a, the bylaw passed where the speed limit, unless otherwise posted, went to 40 kilometers an hour, right? So now the speed limit in most residential areas is 40, if not 30, et cetera, et cetera. Stephen, I would imagine that you're probably going to see this as a win. Uh, can you give us an example of, of some other things? You said Paths for People's been around for about six years now since 2015 have you have you seen advocacy efforts pay off in other ways have you seen some wins with regards to maybe things like roundabouts or other urban designs that have evolved to reflect what we know about traffic calming and, and ultimately safety yeah we see 40 kilometers as a big step in the right direction um we know that 30 kilometers is the kind of science backed the uh best speed that uh, could be instituted on our residential roads. I think when we talk about the speed limits, we do really need to remind ourselves that, you know, there's different kinds of streets and places like main streets, places uh, like the streets in front of our houses. Those are places where we really need to focus on the vulnerability of other road users. And so seeing a lower speed limit, like 30 kilometers per hour does not really significantly slow down most people's journeys, but does create a much safer road environment for other users when there are other users there. And so when we think about some of the successes that we've seen, I think, you know, flagging the uh, neighborhood renewal program like we, uh, like Jessica did earlier, um, like we've seen a really steady increase in improvement in how that uh, that uh, a program like institutes changes within uh, uh, neighborhoods as they're being renewed. Um, I think we see larger investments in active transportation like we we were really excited. We kind of felt like we got a win earlier this week with the uh, fall supplemental budget adjustment that the city was undertaking where we saw almost five million uh, in additional investment in fixing missing links and improving crosswalks and focusing on design projects on larger um, kind of mobility connections for active transportation in the city. So I think we're seeing that perspectives are changing. Um, photo radar is, you know, a great example of a conversation where we still have dissonant perspectives, but I think we see ourselves heading in the right direction. Brent, I'm going to be honest. I just, if, if we call the show Real Talk, I got to be real. When I hear people say, like you three, uh, you go, well, th really, 30 kilometers an hour is the goal. I Internally, I go, oh, come on, 30? 30 is ridiculous. I can sprint 30 kilometers, which is not accurate or true, by the way, but I like to think I can. I think I, I think like Olympic 100 meter sprinters sprint about 35 kilometers an hour. But but I digress. It feels like a crawl. I mean, what cities or what urban centers are showing leadership here? I could tell that it resonated with you when he said 30. Well, you, you told me to tell you when you sound like you're out to lunch. You sound like you're out to lunch now, right? I want you to really think about what the last speaker just said. We're talking about different speeds on different kinds of roads. This is not about reducing speeds to 30 or even 40 on a major arterial, which is where most of that traffic in your trip actually happens. This is on the residential streets. This is where your kids theoretically could be playing if it were actually safe. 
So this is a specific type of road in the hierarchy of roads, a street in the hierarchy of streets, down to potentially 30. And yes, it's only Alberta. It's very Alberta thing to take where we were at 50 and where we should be at 30 and say, Alberta city say, let's split the difference and put it at 40. But to their credit, Calgary first and then Edmonton said, we're also gonna start doing the design speed towards 30 because we're eventually going there. And remember, this is just for the local roads. This is for the residential streets where people actually live, which is a very small part of their trip to work or whatever. And by the way, the stats actually show that because the real things that limit that affect the time of your trip are traffic lights and actual congestion of other cars and all sorts of things like that. This doesn't actually add a lot of time or even in many cases, any time to your trip. So we're talking about trading lives, literally lives. And by the way, other things like quality of life of your street, quality of life of your neighborhood, uh, even the economic value of your house goes up when the street slows down out in front of it. We're talking about trading all those things for a perception of saved time, not yeah. necessarily even a reality. Brent, you know what? I bet you this was probably actually during an interview with you a couple of years ago. I have to assume it was in my previous gig on terrestrial radio. And there was some form of someone had set up like a web form or something. Do you remember this? And you could punch in your home address. You could punch in your destination. So I punched in the radio station and then you could adjust with a drop down menu what the speed limit would be. And much to my malcontent because it disproved my point um i thought you know this is going to make a big difference in my commute on about a 22 23 minute commute dropping the speed limit by, by a pretty significant measure actually changed the commute by like 45 seconds it was really a negligible amount and that was a huge wake up call for me if i'm going to be honest with you for a second um let me ask you this jessica just, uh, just, uh, and just to realize what the stats show is that relatively small change in speed doesn't save more lives by a little bit. It's actually the exponential uh, decrease in likelihood of, of either an accident at all or an, an injury or, or a death goes down dramatically. Right. So we're talking, uh, you know, the order of magnitude power here, the multiplier effect, a little bit of drop of speed, a massive savings in lives and, and insurance rates and all these kinds of things. So if it were just a little bit of a benefit and saving lives, maybe we could have a public policy debate, but it's massive. Yeah. And, and that's Brian, great. And, we, yeah. Go ahead, Jess. Sorry. We, we did that map here in Edmonton. We actually did it for our roads. That must we be what it was. Yeah. Difference. It's amazing. I I created the most convoluted commute possible going through basically every residential road, going down White Ave. I could. I really wanted to test it to see if what we were hearing from folks around this, like, this is going to change my day. This is going to take me away from my family. Um, I wanted to see how that, bore, like, how that bared out in an actual map. The longest difference I could find was a minute. And that was going, you know, all over God's green earth here in Edmonton. And you know what's really amazing? Once we implemented the default speed limit, we had almost no complaints from people. Like, I think we've built up how much people are upset about this. When it actually came to fruition, August 6th, that big day we flipped the switch, people were like, oh, okay, well, no big deal. And, mm. and we've seen through our automated enforcement equipment in those 40 kilometer locations, incredibly high compliance. So, you know, I think we've overbuilt the argument on this. I think we've probably listened to a few particularly loud voices when ultimately Edmontonians they're they're good with it. They they want safer streets. Well, and as if I need to tell you, Jessica, or anybody on this panel, and then and Stephen, I promise I'll hand you the baton. Um, it, it's the cash cow thing, right? That that's what people push back on is they perceive it to be a cash cow. Like it's easy, it's lazy policing. Uh, you know, there's no officer there pulling people over. Uh, you know, smelling people's breath coming from holiday parties. Nobody's wondering whether or not that you know they're smoking cannabis in the vehicle or whether or not there's a kid that's not buckled into the seatbelt. But I'll tell you, and I hate to, I, I don't want to reveal this it's almost unfair but our current front runner for our email of the month contest right now is 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 from a real talker that wrote in a, a compelling and enlightening letter on and and this has been addressed by this panel already the the uh well the sort of quite frankly the white privilege that comes with not understanding how there there is disproportionate enforcement when it comes to human on human interaction and jessica you already made that point so uh, I, i'd be surprised if that doesn't win email of the month but i don't want to discourage further emails so i won't rates over to you what's up 
I, I just wanted to keep on building on Jessica's argument of, you know, people were ready to comply. And what we recognize and what we see in the community is that people are really excited about where we are headed. Um, I think one thing that we were all able to take away from COVID is that there is a huge importance in public space, in safe outdoor public spaces. And, uh, you know, in an environment where we perceive um, and are faced with really difficult budgetary uh, restrictions for municipalities, we need to recognize that there are assets that we've already built into our city, and that's our that's our neighborhood streets. That are that those are our main streets, and if we can ensure that those are safe places for people to recreate, to enjoy, to be out in the community and feel connected, um, that's a huge win that we have. And the speed limit is a key factor. In in seeing the success of that space okay. alongside design and alongside many other features. If you're just tuning in live on the Mixler audio streaming app, that's Stephen Rates from Paths for People. We're talking to Jessica Lamar uh, from Safe Mobility at the City of Edmonton and Brent Totterin, uh, an urbanist and city planner. I want to talk to the three. I mean, a big reason why we're talking photo radar right now is the government of Alberta just made an announcement. I'd like to get all three of you to chime in on that. But I want to go back to the results of our Y Station polling, our question of the week on this, because we invite you uh, every week. And, and we're asking you this week about something completely different and cool. This is sort of like, a, a, you know, these works in progress. We allow we check in through the week and see where you're at on this one. You said uh, don't hide photo radar uh, when you fill in the blank. We give you room to sort of extra, you know, expand your thoughts. Don't hide photo radar. Make it permanently installed in things like school zones. Paint the cameras hot pink, well advertised. I mean, they got the big yellow trucks right now so everybody can see them, know that they're there. If the intent is to reduce speeding in high risk areas like around schools, that would be the move another says i you know the option i had is answers they don't reflect my beliefs i'm a parent the safety of children is too important uh, to reduce speed enforcement since that's one of the most significant factors speed in all collisions my advice to those who complain about speeding tickets is in and then in all caps grow up uh, your rights do not outweigh the rights of others to be safe on the roads on bike lanes or on sidewalks another one of you said i went through a time in my life where i thought going you know 10 kilometers an hour over the posted speed was was business as usual. It's what everybody did. And six months of bi-weekly photo radar tickets eventually changed my behavior, but only because the fine actually made a difference on my monthly budget. The fine has to make a difference to the person receiving it to have the desired effect. And the fact that traffic fines are not progressive is the real cash cow part of them. Uh, Brent, you've heard the story, I'm sure, of uh, NHL Hall of Famer Timu Solani receiving a speeding ticket in Finland, in his native Finland. And because they're tied to India, Come. The speeding ticket, I think off the top of my head, was something like $120,000. Uh, is there room in your mind for progressive type ticketing or enforcement along those lines? Well, hmm, that's interesting. Um, for public policy to work, it has to affect behavior. And uh, it's true that the, the wealthier you are, the less you're going to be affected by a, um, a speeding ticket. But I got to tell you, in a North American context, what the studies show is the ability to keep getting speeding tickets over and over again with no bigger consequence. And the bigger consequence is actually a license ban, because what that actually changes people's perspective and really, really affects their willingness to take a risk on speeding again. So whether it's more money progressively or after five five a year or three a month or something like that, you lose your license for two weeks or a month or even more. You know, the news is filled with people who were speeding for the 16th time and hadn't lost their license yet and then killed someone. Right. So, so, you know, there's, there, 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 there's a basic principle of public policy that says if the punishment for bad behavior is too little, uh, then you don't change behavior. So I think that's a reasonable conversation to have. Can I just say on this issue of whether they should be visible or not, this is a really interesting and fascinating discussion in the policy because on the one hand, the, the photo radar only changes behavior if you know it's there. So the idea of making it very visible is actually accurate. On the other hand, if you only slow down when you know where the photo radar is and you're speeding everywhere else, then you're only very creating very small pockets of safety in a, in a sea of unsafety. Uh -huh. 
So one of the strange, one of the interesting things I found in your in your um, in your poll was I wrote it down. People, some people thought it was set up to trick people, and I immediately thought, trick people into doing what? Not killing each other, <laughs> tricking people into slowing down and being more safe. I, I didn't know what that sentence actually meant, but I have thought for a while that if we had fake photo radar on almost every uh, major intersection where there's even a slight safety issue and the public didn't actually know which ones were real and so slowed down in all of them, um, maybe that would be a more effective. But from a, from a public policy perspective, we know it works, how it gets implemented to actually create safety everywhere, not safety just in certain places, is, a, is an interesting public policy conversation. Well, Jessica, I'd love to get you to chime in on that. Uh, well, first of all, I hate pink, so ours are not going to be pink anytime soon. Um, sorry to your to your real talker, but um, if you're if you live in Edmonton and you still think that the city's trying to trick you with our absolutely fluorescent yellow trucks, then uh, I think we're we're missing something in the conversation here. All of our enforcement locations have advanced warning signage. Our mobile enforcement has um, the bright yellow wraps on them. Uh, the city provides actually every automated enforcement location, whether it's in a device or a mobile enforcement zone uh, through our open data system. You can literally go look up where every single one of them are. In fact, we even provide next week's schedule. You can literally go and, and just like plan your route. <laughs> So this idea that we're trying to trick, I think, is is missing something because we're really committed to an open and transparent program. So people are aware. Yeah, we were kind of we were kind of chuckling at that. And, and I'm and I'm not taking myself off the hook here, but it's the team at Y Station that puts the polling together. So that was their word trick, which I which I actually kind of laughed at and loved. And we talked about it on the air a few days ago and saying it's I mean, trickery. I mean, we're using an inflammatory word in kind of a facetious way, but but trickery has always been part of speed enforcement in the sense you'd have the cop behind the bush or behind the billboard or, you know, there, there's always been trickery. It's why there's ghost cars. It's why there's all kinds of things. I mean, I don't know if the word trickery is appropriate, but it got us talking, didn't it? Let's get into Alberta government policy here, and then I want to give all three of you a chance to chime in on this. Um, uh, it was back on December 1st, so I guess about two weeks ago, two weeks and change. Uh, Alberta Transportation Minister Rajan Sani announced uh, photo radar a hot button an issue for Albertans, obviously. Uh, opposition leader Rachel Notley's been chiming in, calling it a cash cow. I don't know what's going on with that. But anyway, back yeah. to the, yeah, <laughs> Stephen, I'll get you. Can, I was like, did somebody hack Notley's tweet? Like, what the hell is, I don't know what's going on with that. She's tweeting about the Edmonton Oilers. Like, does she have a, I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I digress. Uh, says the minister, there are many that feel Photorator can be used to unfairly generate revenue instead of using it for its intended purpose. Uh, for context, Photorator generating $203 million in Alberta a year or so ago shared by the province and 26 participating municipalities starting in April of next year. Municipalities will be barred from using photorator on roads where drivers must rapidly change speeds like freeway on and off ramps. I think that's fair. Police must also keep photorator off roads with speed limits lower than 50 with the exception of school and construction zones, and a driver cannot receive two automated tickets within a five-minute span. Vehicles must be clearly visible to drivers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People can read all the full details online. Uh, Jessica, this impacts what you do, I think, probably on a daily basis, so why don't we start with you, and then we'll just make our way down the line. What do you make of the government of Alberta's steps here, and uh, are they a roadblock to what you're trying to accomplish? Well, I'll spare you the Jess Lamar lecture walking through the 27 page guideline, but there's there's a few things that stand out. First of all, when the province made this announcement, Minister Sani um, opened it up by fully committing to the evidence that voter aid or automated enforcement makes streets safer. That's the first time I've heard that that clearly communicated from our province. Uh, and that really sits very closely with the belief of the city of Edmonton. Uh, something else I was really heartened to see in the guidelines themselves, many of Edmonton's leading practices have been now built into those guidelines as expectations for municipalities across uh, Alberta. So for example, the vehicle routes uh, for our vehicles, we chose to do that. No one forced us to. We wanted to change the conversation with the public around automated enforcement. We wanted to make automated enforcement more visible 
Uh, and obviously um, that's something that the province has picked up and is, is sharing. The guideline also is calling for a much higher level of data and reporting, something that we uh, in Edmonton have been doing for quite some time. I think we have the luxury of a, a sophisticated and mature program here. Um, we have lots of, of um, you know, high tech equipment. We have really skilled and talented staff um, who are working hard to keep the, the streets safe. So all of that's built in. Um, there are obviously some challenges inherent in, in the new guidelines that come forward as well. There's a number of um, changes to what is currently enabled as criteria for locations. So in the previous guideline, there were six main criteria that a municipality could look to to establish whether or not a new automated enforcement site could be set up. So that's things like, you know, a history of speeding, a history of collisions, if it's a playground zone, a construction zone. Um, but there's a couple that are, have been removed. One of them is uh, sites where we've received significant community complaint and concern. So when we hear from people, and this is something that most people don't know, we actually hear from people requesting automated enforcement way more than we hear from people complaining about huh. automated enforcement. I'm almost not surprised. Um, yeah. It's, am it's amazing to me how many people, and for two years, because of the moratorium that's been in place, we haven't been able to establish new sites. So we've been operating within our current, you know, sort of inventory. We can't do that anymore. That's not a criteria that can be used moving forward, nor is establishing a site uh, based off where the Edmonton Police Service could not safely enforce in person. That happens to, based on road design. Sometimes it's not a good idea to have somebody parked on the side of a high-speed roadway, for example. But then, of course, the 40K, that's a challenge um, for us. And when we take a look at our current mobile automated enforcement sites, we have about 550. That impacts 40% of them. That's a huge chunk of where we provide support right now. Uh, and when we take a look at those sites, they're the places where Edmontonians want us to be the most. You know, people get the most annoyed about the Hending and the Yellowhead. And I get, I get that. I don't agree, but I understand. Um, but we're really going to be challenged moving forward with being present in the more residential spaces, the high, the high volume um, spaces for people walking, for people cycling. Um, and that's something that my team is working around right now to understand, okay, where's the gap gonna be? And what other tools do we have at the city to help support staying in those spaces? Uh, Stephen, did you see the government's announcements, new policy coming in in April and the spring is a setback or how are you wrapping your mind around it? Yeah, we believe that it is taking a step backwards and making streets unsafer for everybody. Um, and it, it isn't really this conversation like has connected the dots. I think that, you know, when we move a little bit slower, we're all getting around a little bit safer. And, you know, the places that are closest to our hearts and it is our home. So, you know, removing the or adding the 50 kilometer per hour limit and not allowing uh, photo radar to be used in areas below that. Um, that's highly concerning because that's where, you know, as Jessica has indicated, that's where people would like to see it so that we can alter people's behavior. Um, and so, you know, it really isn't rocket science i know that we had chris hadfield on earlier but you know this is this is a rocket science to like be able to communicate this in a progressive way and so i that's why i made the whole like when we were mentioning the the tweets coming out from the uh ndp that um yeah like they're like people understand that if you are if we are able to have photo radar in a way to help shape behavior that you know the places right in front of our house are going to be safer um like that is not a difficult message to convey and we don't have to you know um you know yeah we don't have to fight fire with fire or go lower you know it, it, there's a way to simply communicate this so we're concerned about it and we would you know want to ensure that if that message that minister sani uh led with that we're focused on safety um you know if that's the truth then why aren't we focused on safety right in front of our own houses right in front of our homes um you know that's we'd love to see that turned around because um, it is imminently important to kids walking to school, to seniors um, getting to doctor's appointments, to folks in mobility devices getting around their communities. Um, these are where our most vulnerable street users are, and we should have enforcement that reflects that.
Uh, by the way, I wanted to fact check myself before I go to you, Brent. Uh, it was not Timu Solani who received the enormous, I mean, he did receive an enormous ticket, but but let me just provide some background here. And this is way back in like 2003, 2004, by the way. So consider inflation and everything else. But this is based on Finland's policy of of, 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 of a, a progressive uh, speed enforcement, sort of a punitive program. Uh, Solani was, was clocked speeding and based on his income uh, was fined the equivalent of 40,000 US dollars. It was Nokia executive Rima Quisla, based on his uh, salary, uh, his Nokia salary equivalent to 13 million US dollars a year, that was clocked. Get this, 65. Yeah, we could debate whether or not someone should make 13 million a year, but I digress. Uh, based 65 miles an hour in a 50. So moving at a clip, I, off the top of my head, that's that's about that's about what that's like 125 in a hundred, something like that ish, approximately. Uh, he was fined the equivalent of 103 thousand u.s dollars so so about 125 130 canadian uh pretty huge fine anyway wanted to fact check fact check that um brent totteran what, what do you think about what the alberta government has put out there for april and and what our your fellow co-panelists have had to say about it well a few things first of all just on that example you know it's interesting how we as people when we hear well 65 in a 50 zone doesn't sound that much higher than the speed limit and a lot of people are already used to going 10 kilometers higher than the speed limit as the usual but you have to understand that at 50 kilometers an hour already even with smaller cars because they all this study was done with smaller cars before we had big trucks uh, in everybody's driveway and, and big suvs even with smaller cars nine out of ten people hit in a collision at 50 are going to die so when you have from 50 to 65, everybody's going to die. And I think we have to stop thinking about this in the context of, well, that's only 10% higher than the speed limit. No, you put it in the context of the likelihood of death at a collision, a death of a kid, death of a senior, death of a person, a pedestrian, someone on a bike, anybody, frankly, out of the protective barrier of another car. So we have to make it real life or real death when we're having these conversations about how much over the speed limit people are going and the fact that the speed limit is too high in the first place. So to your question now, I don't I haven't been following the provincial announcement nearly as, as much as the locals. But based on what the local is, locals are saying, I would absolutely agree that it sounds like very bad politics. Uh, trumping life safety and all the other benefits of slowing down speeds in the local residential communities, uh, just to get a soundbite for folks who who buy into this idea that photo radar is a cash cow. Yeah, like it's very it's com it seems completely op opposite to start off your your talk talking about life safety and then do something that is counter to that. Now, I was not happy with what Rachel Notley said about this because that seemed like she she is smart enough to know that what she said was wrong just wrong in terms of life safety, full stop. But uh, this new approach it seems to me is very likely hamstringing life safety, as well as the ability to improve quality of life in residential neighborhoods. And it strikes me that it is such stupid politics that the first time a kid dies because on a, on a dangerous street and somebody points out that there used to be or could have been photo radar that would have slowed people down, but this new policy approach by the province hamstrung that, then we're going to have a political conversation. Yeah, this is, but, uh, we're showing. This is not, it's not good policy. It's it, not good public policy. Yeah, we're, we're showing that tweet for the benefit of people listening to the podcast. Notley back on December 1st tweeted, uh, UCP continues to hammer household budgets with photo radar. Jason Kenney's UCP government will continue to hit Alberta drivers with costly photo radar tickets, despite a lack of evidence that they contribute to traffic safety. And I'll just read off the top. I'm not picking and choosing comments. I'll just go. Jeff Nochtegal says, this is not it. Uh, Edwin says, well, don't speed then. Um, you know, Chad says, easy solution, don't speed. Steph says, sorry, Rachel, but we need to punish dangerous drivers in real ways. Ed says, I love you, Rachel, but this is a horrible take. There's a really simple solution to not hurting your budget from photo radar. Alyssa says, all caps, not necessary, Rachel. Also, you don't want a speeding ticket, don't speed. This is not an issue worth your notice. Tyler chimes in, says, as a transportation engineer and a certified road safety professional, there is significant evidence of the impact of both reducing speed and collision through the use of automated enforcement. Miles says, somebody's comms team is maybe jumping at the bit a little too quickly. So it didn't play well uh, for Alberta's former well, premier very, who wants to be very, premier. 
it's super disappointing when smart progressive uh, uh, politicians, and I consider Notley to be both of those things, uh, says something so mind-numbingly bad. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that it was somebody in her strategic team who thought they could win some political points by putting this out there. But not only was it bad politics, because it, it it everybody who knows better is gonna call her on it, including me. I did. Uh, but um, it's 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 not even good. Um, it's not even factually correct, and it makes it really easy to say. Here's all the evidence. I tweeted some evidence in response to that, for example. But can I address this issue of the cash cow, which is another one of those red herrings that, as as was said earlier, a very small percentage of the people raise in order to attack something that they can't really justify attacking. What I've always thought is that cities should counteract that lame argument by making sure that the money that gets generated from it doesn't just go into the general coffers of the city. Because I've always said there's a lot of policies that people claim are cash cows. And I've said when they go into the general uh, coffers of the city and sort of disappear and nobody knows what they're being used for, it does maybe feel like it's just being uh, created, done for revenue purposes. I've always thought cities should say every cent collected by photo radar should immediately be directed into safer infrastructure, should immediately be directed into other things that will save traffic lives, lives of people in traffic incidents, should be directed toward public transit, et cetera. Because then you can draw a direct line that this isn't going into general revenue, This the money's filtering right back into saving lives. And I, I have always thought that politically, that would pop the balloon of this rather lame narrative that it's just a, a revenue uh, take or a cash cow. Jessica, can we expect that from the city oh, of Edmonton? Chris. Well, the city of Edmonton has been doing it for a decade. Yeah. Um, so Brent's been reading city policy behind the scenes because I think that's how that's how he likes to spend his evenings. Um, <laughs> we have that here. So the city council here in Edmonton set up the Traffic Safety Automated Enforcement Reserve. And that's where every dollar from automated enforcement uh, revenue that the city receives goes to. And that money is dedicated to reinvestments into making our roads safer. So that, that goes to things like uh, making sure there's no overhead for our automated enforcement program. That doesn't cost taxpayers anything for us to have that. It um, it sends $22 million a year over to supporting traffic enforcement through the Edmonton Police Service. And it's reinvested into engineering upgrades and community programming that helps make our streets safer. Like over 300 crosswalks have been upgraded since 2015 with that money. Millions a year goes into that. So the cash cow thing doesn't bear on Edmonton. We don't we don't subscribe to that we are all about making sure um, that that money is used well and you know at the end of the day it's actually a moot point this idea that we're rolling in dough like Donald Duck in the you know in the piles of money it doesn't exist anymore because people have been slowing down uh, which is great that's what I want to see I actually want to see that revenue go to zero because people are slowing down um, and for a number of reasons, including uh, the provincial government's budget in 2019, which increased the percentage of revenue that stays at the province level versus at the municipal level, um, and people slowing down, we're we're not bringing in nearly as much as people think we are. Um, so I think the the facts are out there, uh, but sometimes it's it's easier for us to hold on to that argument because it makes us feel better when we get a ticket. Fair enough, uh, Jessica. Much much of uh, the reason I think that this show has experienced success in its first year is because we, we do insist on accuracy and fact checking, and that's why I must call you out and remind you that it is in fact Scrooge McDuck uh, that dives into and oh. swims in the money. Um, it's the money bin, which is a large storage building where Scrooge McDuck houses his three cubic acres of cash three cubic acres i'm not sure what the dollar amount is on that but i would imagine it's quite significant so i knew i was going to screw something up in the data today if, if you're going to screw something up make it the disney reference um and i will say this the people on, on another note uh you know the people of edmonton voted as well there was a mayoral candidate uh back in october that vowed to get rid of photo radar and everyone will remember he, he got his ass kicked in the election so if that were to be something that edmontonians had truly wanted that promise alone 
I think could have seen someone take the mayor's office and it, and it just quite frankly didn't work. I want to give each of you a chance to sort of offer a closing statement, just something quick for us to think about. I hate to leave something on the table. We wrap up the call and you go, oh, I wish I would have had a chance to say that. So, so Stephen, why don't you go first? Something to leave us with something, no pun intended for us to walk with over the next few days as we think about what we've heard here. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, I have two little kernels just on next steps for Notley regarding that tweet. I think it, it acknowledges the issue properly and that, you know, if you are from a lower income household, that can be a really big ding. And so there is a progressive way to move forward on this policy, you know, and we already spelled it out with that example in Finland. Um, so I, I want to slide that in. But on the larger note around this conversation, I think what we're seeing is that it's backed by the data. It's um, backed up by what people would like to see in their communities and have their communities feel like. Um, and so you know, I think we're ready to continue moving in that direction of safer, more livable streets. And although photo radar can be a little um, annoying to receive in the mail, it's part of that better process of seeing our streets becoming more safe and livable. And so, you know, we're looking forward to continuing to be part of that process and working with counterparts at the city of Edmonton. Good stuff. Jessica? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Here's what I would say. Uh, It's going to take all of us to do this work well. Uh, We all have a role to play and and something to contribute to making our streets safer. And yeah, nobody likes getting a ticket in the mail. You can avoid it. And people know that. Uh, So really, what's the big question here? It's around taking a moment to consider our neighbors. We're all Edmontonians and we need to care as much about the people we don't know whose house we're driving past as we care about when people drive past our road. And I think that's something that's come out for me so much in the last couple of years of the pandemic is that that real community um, sense and valuing when we care about each other and we want each other's lives to be uh, healthy and safe and full. Um, and and that's really what Vision Zero and the work that the city of Edmonton is doing, you know, specifically through safe mobility work, but also our larger city plan. That's what we're trying to help create and enable for everybody here in, Edmont- in Edmonton is, is just a better life together. And we can do that. Uh, drivers, people driving can do that by being really aware of their speed and what's going on around them. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why we have automated enforcement. All right. Totterin, last word to you, my man. Well, I'm hoping through this conversation, people get a broader perspective on speed because we, we, we get focused on the minutia and the politics, but speed in cities, I'm not talking about on highways, I'm talking speed in cities. Um, there's, a, there's a fact-based reality to the effect it has on our streets, on our neighborhoods and on our lives. We know that this, this attitude of just a little faster, a little over the speed limit when the speed limit might be already too high in the first place, literally will kill people if you have a collision. And by the way, speed actually significantly increases the likelihood of having a collision. So it makes it more likely you're going to hit somebody because your reaction time is smaller. Your actual field of vision constricts when you're going faster, as studies have shown. And guess who is most likely to be affected by that collision in terms of being killed? Kids, disproportionately kids, and not just in school zones, anywhere where where the public realm interacts with vehicles. So we have this tendency, and it drives me crazy when I hear it in the media, where the, where the media or the police say speed was not a factor in that collision. And what I constantly tweet when I see that is speed is always a factor in that collision. What they mean is that technically you weren't going over the speed limit, if they can even establish that uh, uh, with complete certainty. But But it never addresses the question, is the speed limit too high in the first place? And speed is always a factor because speed contributes to your likeliness to have an accident and the consequences of that accident. And it is literally life or death. And if life isn't enough to get you to think differently about your speed, think about the quality of your streets, the quality of your your neighborhoods, the, the value of your homes, all of these things. It's incredible when you actually start to connect the dots all of the public benefits and private personal benefits that result from us slowing down and doing a better job of regulating speed. Speed. We've quite properly focused on life safety because literally people are dying, but, but there's so much more to the quality of life that we can achieve if we do this more smartly. 
I encourage you to follow all three of these folks on Twitter. Of course, uh, Sarah, every morning from our official account at Real Talk RJ includes the Twitter handles of who you're going to be hearing here on the show. Uh, that was Brent Totterin, president of Totterin Urban Works out of Vancouver. Jessica Lamar joining us, director of safe mobility for the city of Edmonton. And uh, Stephen Rates, a board member with Paths for People. My sincere thanks to the three of you. A very happy holiday season. And we appreciate your time. Thanks, Good everyone. stuff. Thank you. Hoyles, I'm kind of glad we didn't have like the cash cow voice on the panel because I think they would have they would have got beat up a little bit. I think that was a pretty good conversation. Uh, yes, I, I, yes, I agree. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I, I always have room for. I always want to have that like the kind of character. You know, the character on there. The, like I interviewed a guy um, that was actually arrested by Edmonton police for. Like, he was like, it was like, he was fine with like public nuisance or something. He got off on all the charges, but he was like putting up signs that was like cash cow ahead, photo radar ahead. He was just like, he, just a quirky fella. And he would find out where the photo radar was every day. And then he'd set up shop 50 yards before the photo radar. And he'd have all these billboards, not billboards, but big signs, yeah. placards and things like that. A real character. Right. But this was to me a focused database, positive conversation. Uh, or at least a bit of a wake-up call. And, and I think that, you know what, as much as I hate to admit it, on, on talk shows, there is room for that, too. Absolutely. And I think that guy that was putting up those signs was was helping prove the point that, yes, if if someone, if they are aware that the speeding, yeah. the speed trap is there, people are going to slow down. So he's actually yeah. furthering the point. Also, in that conversation, hearing that, you know, the opposition to uh, radar is minimal, or less than you know the what it is perceived to be. It's a loud uh, minority, minority opposition, which is oftentimes the case with everything. I mean, you uh, look at vaccine compliance in Canada; it's eighty-five percent, uh, or at least eighty-five percent. I think Alberta's premier said, or at least the Alberta government said this week uh, for for the twelve plus crowd. So you know that would lead me to believe that you know fifteen percent, or you know you know one in seven, approximately ish, one in seven are pushing back. But you sure hear about it a lot, right? Absolutely. We didn't even get into the conversation about parents that have been emailing us, telling us they're getting. They're running into protesters, getting their kids vaccinated. It's like, what the hell is going Gross. on with that? There's always a lot going on behind the scenes here on the show. Check out what I have in my hand, my friends. This is the Pink Glow Pineapple, and you can get these right now at Friesen Brothers. Absolutely amazing. I want to show you. It comes in its own box, which is like super cool. This is part of the tradition of giving fruit for the holidays. You can gift one of these pineapples. And by the way, they're on sale as of today for just $14.99. They come with a gift card in the box. This is so super cool. So you can actually dedicate it to the person that you're gifting this pineapple to. I want to show you this gift card you can fill out. It's like a happy holidays thing. It talks a bit about the sparkling treasure to make your season bright. Sam, is it a pain if we roll that video? Instagram story video oh, from we don't Friesen have Brothers. Anymore, we don't sorry. have no yeah. problem. I didn't ask you to keep it. Sam's always got so much going on behind the scenes. You can check out Friesen Brothers Instagram and you can cut into these pineapples. They're like this fleshy pink color. Absolutely amazing. $14.99 starting today on sale at Friesen Brothers and that price will remain in effect all the way through the 30th. We had such a great conversation with their produce director who joined us and he's so, I love how passionate it Daniel is. He's the produce director for all of Friesen Brothers and he was telling us about the tradition of gifting fruit and from some Asian cultures, how, how that's made its way to, to North America and, and, and sort of the history of the Satsuma orange and the Mandarin orange and how that all became part of the tradition. You can see the displays in Friesen Brothers stores across Alberta. I love their passion. They are all in on celebrating holiday tradition. 16 stores across Alberta, Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Our friends at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park want to remind you that holiday log cakes, these are like just the classic DQ holiday log cake. They're on for half price right now. If you name drop me or Real Talk at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road, Fudge and Crunch Center, which I go straight for. I am shameless on the holiday log cake here. I go straight for the center. Surrounded by vanilla and chocolate, soft served and decorated with your favorite holiday design. Don't forget they're selling DQ bucks in support of the Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation. Donate five bucks. You get five bucks back in DQ bucks 
win-win from the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Our friends at Kubi Energy, big shout out uh, to them. It's been an amazing year for Kubi Energy as more and more Canadians are tapping into these solar energy solutions to power their professional and personal lives. Whether it's a residential install or a commercial install, Kubi's doing it all across Western Canada, proudly based out of Edmonton and Kamloops, BC. You can get your free quote online right now at kubienergy.ca. And don't forget to send us your positive reflection that's presented by Kubi Energy every Monday here on the show. You can send it to talk at ryanjesperson.com. I'm about to read an email, by the way, that that I couldn't decide whether it's a positive reflection or a trash talk, so I'm throwing it into... You'll see what I mean in just a second. You'll see what I mean. It's a, it's such a great email. That's I love it. That's a feat yeah, to no, be able to make both. It's it from in Brad. Both columns. It's from Brad. That's coming up. Uh, because, of course, you know, each and every Friday, uh, our friends at Local Waste, you know, them family-owned, 25 years they've been operating commercial construction, residential waste and recycling collection, you know, driven by integrity. They've actually told us stories with... with customers and clients of theirs have, have come over from other waste providers, the, the, the collectors, and, and they've they've gone, yeah, we need this big, huge bin for our business. And local waste is like, we don't think you need a bin that big. We don't think you need to be spending that much right now. All right, let's grow to a bigger bin as your business grows. That's how they roll. You can trust them. That's why we're proud to partner with them at localwaste.ca. So yeah, every Friday, I mean, it's a tradition when we wrap up our broadcast week. Our friends at Local Waste give us a chance to blow off some steam. We love it. It's 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 become this thing that we sort of have circled on the calendar. You know what's written there, right there on the calendar. It's trash talk! Yeah, that's right. So this one from Brad, I get this, and uh, and the subject line says, yeah, about that email about abortion. And, and so I go, okay, and so I click it, and I open it, and then... Brad sends me an email and then and then he sends this one right after and he goes, ah, don't read my email. It's Christmas and I don't want to be so negative. And I thought, is that a positive reflection or is that a trash talk? Hmm. But he specifically informed me not to read his email, not to read the email. And I was wondering, like, what would our, what do you think our studio audience thinks about that one? I'm not sure what they, what... oh yeah. Oh, oh, they don't like the call, Brad. They want me to read the email, but you told me, that's fine, buddy. Thanks for being in touch with the show. How about this one from Allison who says, I've got some trash talk for this week. My beef is with one of the things you mentioned in your introduction for Dr. Agolsky. You remember that? Uh, Allison says divorce rates are increasing and people say that millennials don't value the institution of marriage. What a load of BS, says Allison. If by the institution of marriage, you mean the oppression of women? Uh, in generations past, many women did not have a choice to leave their marriages because they had no way to support themselves financially and they were heavily judged for leaving. As a matter of fact, they still are. The social pressures to stay in the marriage were and are enormous. And maybe divorce rates are increasing because now more women are trying trapped in marriages actually have the ability to leave when they want to in all caps she says but it's not all roses and sunshine there's still so many women trapped in marriages and relationships and they can't leave for a variety of reasons we must remain steadfast in lifting up women people who identify as women and people who are socialized as women and working toward gender equality so that we have a choice no one should celebrate the length of the marriage if one of the parties was stuck in it and so i say Fuck the patriarchy! That from Allison! What about this one from Manit, who says, uh, As many of you may know, it snowed in Edmonton this week, and I know not all of us have had the luxury of parking our cars in garages, but could people who park outside at least try to clear the snow off their cars? How the fuck are you seeing out of your window with all that snow? You're dangerous as hell to everybody driving around you. I haven't even mentioned the snow blowing off your car onto my windshield. Snow brushes exist for a reason. Clear the snow off your damn car! That from Manit. What about this one from Robert who says, I've had my driver's license for 24 years now. This is going to be the 24th year in a row I've had to scream this out loud to people. Turn on your lights when it's dark. Figure it out. And then Robert signs off. Peace. I love that, Robert. Peace right back at you. How about this one from Lisa who says, hey. I see your 30-year-old able-bodied ass taking a family parking spot outside the big box store, running it alone while a mom and a baby and a toddler, they got to push a heavy two-seater stroller, an an extra 100 meters through the snow. Have some respect 
for the parents for whom this is probably the only free hour of the day they have to get groceries. The extra walk in minus 20 will make the kids crankier the rest of her day that much harder. But you don't care because what you need is more important. You need it as quickly as possible. And you don't want to walk extra in the cold. Then you will probably complain about the loud kids crying in the store and the mom is too tired to control her kids. There are family spots for a reason. The spot didn't belong to you and you should be ashamed of yourself. Signed, Lisa, a tired mom of two who are old enough to not need the family parking spot anymore so we don't use it. Thanks, Lisa. And finally, this one from Tracy. She got it in last minute, just moments before we went live today. She says, after two years, the reason for many trash talks, me yelling at my computer, you would think these things after two years would not still be going on. Number one, claiming we are not in a pandemic because they don't know the definition of the word. Number two, we get a flu shot, not a flu vaccine. Tracy says, really? Somebody said that to me. Number three, you can still get COVID, so what's the point of a vaccine? Ever hear about seatbelts? Tracy says, number four, this has never happened before in history. 100 years ago during the flu pandemic, if you didn't wear a mask or stay at home, you were put in jail for a perspective check. And five, telling people my daughter has lupus, so we're all getting vaccinated. There's always that one person who said to me, for real, she has lupus because you got vaccinated. Tracy says, I'll tell you what, try not to give yourself a neck cramp shaking your head at these. These are true stories from Tracy. Your trash talks come from real emails sent to us to talk at ryanjesperson.com. We always love to hear from you. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Hoyles doesn't want to sing 24-7 anymore. We didn't dig into that, did we? That's why you got to follow her on Twitter. Coming up next week, a focus on faith and the holidays. A roundtable with Reverend Michael Corrin, Rabbi Khalil Rose, and the Al Rashid Mosque's Noor Al Hennedy. Plus, our year-end roundup, roundtable. And on Friday, the morning of Christmas Eve, per tradition, the second year in a row, a private and very fun Zoom call with us and all of our Real Talk Patreon supporters. You can find out more on how you can get in on that crew by following the details at ryanjesperson.com. If I yell anymore, I'm not going to have a voice for Monday, so I'm going to sign off and say, have a great weekend from all of us Real Talkers. <laughs>